Hackers broke in and stole millions of records from 23andMe, but is this any worse than the day-to-day -day data selling that they do? 23andMe, the leader in genetic testing, just got hit with a cyber bombshell. Hackers broke into their vault, snatching up a treasure trove of user data. This incident is noteworthy because in addition to emails and phone numbers, they have genetic information. And along with that, your predispositions to certain diseases and connections to relatives you never knew you had. 23andMe provides a direct-to-consumer genetic testing service in which customers provide a saliva sample that is laboratory analyzed using genotyping to generate reports on health and relations. 23andMe said its systems were not breached. Instead, it said, the data theft was likely due to people reusing passwords on their 23andMe accounts that were exposed in past breaches from other sites called credential stuffing. If you need some motivation to stop recycling passwords, this is it. Once the breach was discovered, over 5 million records had been stolen. A hacker claiming to have stolen the data posted some records for sale on the platform Breach Forums for $1 to $10 per record. What kind of data does 23andMe store? Let's have a look at the privacy policy. Consider what happens when somebody sends a vial of saliva to 23andMe. The person knows they're sharing their DNA with a genomics company to be tested so they can learn about relatives and genetic risks. They may not realize that the data will be resold to pharmaceutical firms or other third-party data brokers in depersonalized form. In addition to genetic material, 23andMe also characterizes your phenotype, your behavior, through questionnaires and through its app for research and marketing purposes. They also collect location information. 23andMe sells this information in quote-unquote depersonalized form to pharmaceutical companies, advertisers, and data brokers unless you opt out. 23andMe collects your registration information, which is name, user ID, password, date of birth, address, credit card, genetic information, the genotype and the reports generated from that. The saliva sample is also analyzed. They also collect your self-reported information like disease conditions, health-related information, personal traits, and answers to the constant questionnaires they send. This adds to your phenotype or behavior information. Finally, user content is any information that you transmit to 23andMe, like comments on the forum. Service providers collect all the information they can while you interact with the website and app. This data might be mouse movements and your specific location, and it's also collected by 23andMe. 23andMe receives information about you from other users and third parties, like data brokers. They also can combine your data with the data of third parties to create a more complete profile. They may also infer new material from the data they, they collect. For example, they use your genetic information to predict certain health predispositions, or they may infer your location, such as city, state, and country, from your IP address. The research consent is a special opt-in program which collects even more information about you, including the possibility of sequencing your genes. If you agree to the special consent, you allow 23andMe researchers to use your information to study a wide variety of research topics. They strip your name and contact information, and the info may be combined with similar information from many research participants. 23andMe research info may be shared with third parties, such as nonprofit organizations, pharmaceutical companies, or academic institutions. Once your information is in the hands of the third parties, it's beyond the control of 23andMe. It's unlikely that you'll directly benefit from your participation in the research, though you and others may benefit in the future from discoveries that lead to healthcare advances or improvements in 23andMe's products and services. Taking part in this research is completely voluntary and you can change your consent choice at any time without affecting your access to 23andMe products and services. If the data has already been sold, however, 23andMe cannot take it back or delete it. A subset of research participants may have their DNA reanalyzed using another technology such as sequencing. The sequencing may focus on particular genes or regions, on the coding portions of the genome, also known as the exome, or on the whole genome. The sample sizes needed for sequencing vary considerably depending on the type of study. To identify the causal mutation for a rare recessive disease, it may only require a nuclear family of four people. If 23andMe is involved in a bankruptcy or merger, 
Your personal information may be sold or transferred as part of that transaction. However, we also know that 23andMe and the new entity can change the privacy policy at any time without meaningful participation by you. So that's it for the privacy policy in a nutshell. The privacy policy is clearly written and presented, but here's the million dollar question. How many people actually read the fine print before diving in? There are some other implications for the data collected that are not so clear from the privacy policy. In order to de-identify the data so it can't be linked to a single individual, companies typically remove name and social security numbers. In practice, however, any attempt at de-identification requires removal not only of your identifiable information, but also of information that can identify you when considered in combination with other information known about you. Here's an example. First, think about the number of people that share your specific zip code. Next, think about how many of those people also share your birthday. Now, think about how many people share your exact birthday, zip code, and gender. According to one landmark study, these three characteristics are enough to uniquely identify 87% of the U.S. population. What's more, whatever personal data is collected can be misused by employees or departments stolen by criminals or foreign governments. For example, in 1943, the Census Bureau turned over confidential information, including names and addresses, to help the U.S. government identify individual Japanese Americans during World War II. Even for Google search data, you don't have a guarantee of privacy. Recently, a Colorado court decision permitted police to use Google search histories to identify identify suspects in criminal investigations. They compiled a list of people who had searched particular keywords. Apps like the 23andMe app also collect location data even when they don't need it to function. The collection of this location data on our devices is sufficiently precise for law enforcement to place suspects at the scene of a crime and for juries to convict people on the basis of that evidence. Having this data collected in the first place increases your chance of being falsely accused of a crime. Practically speaking, there is no way to de-identify individual location data since these data points serve as unique personal identifiers of their own. And even when location data is said to have been anonymized, re-identification can be achieved by correlating de-identified data with other publicly available data like voter rolls or information that's sold by data brokers. One study from 2013 found that researchers could uniquely identify 50% of people using only two randomly chosen time and location data points. Imagine how accurate they could be with 10 or 100 data points. The saliva samples are analyzed and provide information about you. Scientists testing saliva samples from COVID testing saw that people's oral microbiomes stayed fairly constant within an individual, creating a personal signature to the pattern of your mouth microbe. Furthermore, they can be biomarkers of disease like periodontitis, dental caries, HIV, diabetes, and potentially cancer. Moreover, your DNA contains highly sensitive and personal information, as it is essentially the blueprint of your biological makeup. Genetic information's longevity, immutability, you can't change your DNA like you can a lost password, and predictive ability about future health make it extremely valuable. The kinds of sensitive information that can be derived from DNA include family relationships such as paternity, maternity, and other familial connections. It can be used to identify biological relatives, including those previously unknown to the individual. For about 1% to 3% of children, their actual father is someone different from who they think. Ethnicity and ancestry can include information about geographical origins, ethnic groups, and lineage tracing back several generations. Health information like genetic predispositions to conditions like cancer, health disease, and genetic disorders can also be determined from DNA. Health insurance premiums could use DNA information to screen for risks and adjust premiums accordingly or deny coverage. Genetic traits, including physical characteristics like eye color, hair color, and height, DNA can also give more insights into complex traits influenced by multiple genes. DNA can show whether an individual is a carrier of certain genetic conditions that could be passed on to their children, even if the individual does not exhibit symptoms of the condition. People can be carriers for cystic fibrosis or sickle cell disease. Responses to medications can be influenced by genetic makeup. For example, studies have estimated that 50% of the liability to opioid dependence is due to the additive genetic factors. 
Behavioral and psychological tendencies might be revealed by DNA testing. For example, a certain type of dopamine receptor, DRD4, is associated with infidelity and one-night stands. It's also a biometric identifier. DNA is a unique identifier, much like fingerprints, and can be used in forensic science for identification purposes in criminal investigations and legal proceedings. For example, a DNA sample was obtained in a sexual assault medical kit from a victim in 2016. Then, years later, it was used by the San Francisco Police Department to name the same victim as a suspect in an unrelated property crime. The police dropped the property charges, saying it violated her Fourth Amendment rights against unreasonable searches. In another example, genetics data was used to identify the California Golden State Killer, who terrorizes victims from the 70s and 80s. Evidence from the cold case was screened against genomes from the Ancestry website GED Match, and a familial match was found that led cops to the killer. Additionally, genetic information is unchangeable and can have implications for an individual's privacy, insurance coverage, employment, and more. Because DNA doesn't change, once it's out there, it's impossible to take back. The Electronic Frontier Foundation points out the ability to research family history and disease shouldn't carry the risk that our data will be accessible in data breaches through scraped accounts by law enforcement, insurers, or in other ways we can't foresee. But in these days of frequent data breaches, is it really unforeseeable? And are the legitimate ways that the company uses the data that you ostensibly agreed to almost as bad? If you read the documents carefully, all the information about what data they're sharing is in there. The challenge is that people don't read it. To register a DNA kit on 23andMe, customers are required to accept the company's privacy policy and terms and conditions, which together disclose what data 23andMe collects, how it's protected, and how it can be used and shared. Then, customers are given the option to participate in 23andMe research. A lengthy document explains what that entails, and if they click a green box at the bottom saying, I do give consent, then the majority of their data, their genetic profile, plus any information they enter into surveys or authorize 23andMe to import, can be used for research in de-identified and aggregated form. It's a lot of fine print that looks like a lot of other fine print that people on the internet click through every day to buy things and watch programs. People are so used to just clicking through these agreements without reading them. 23andMe customers can withdraw consent at any time, but it may take up to 30 days for the request to go into effect, and any data shared prior to that date can't be clawed back from any third parties that might be using it. It's like trying to unring a bell. Deleting your data entirely is even harder because federal laws require clinical laboratories to keep de-identified data test results on file for a minimum of 10 years. Genetics companies may claim that they do not sell your genetic data to third parties, but the independent labs they send their sample to for analysis can. Even if the companies claim that they will only trade non-identifiable data, we can see that the ease of re-identifying the data makes this claim meaningless. 23andMe can, in theory, unilaterally change those terms and conditions and privacy policies at any time. As a commercial enterprise, it's not bound by the same obligations as medical professionals. It doesn't swear to uphold the Hippocratic Oath. Its main legal obligation is to its shareholders and profit. The hypothesis of this company was to circumvent medical records and just self-report. The CEO of 23andMe, Wajiki, told a room full of researchers at an event, anyone can go get genomes. What's really hard is phenotypic data, observable characteristics or traits. To get that kind of health and behavior information, 23andMe is continually pushing surveys out to its customers. A few questions here, a few questions there. And people love talking about themselves. We specialize in capturing phenotypic data on people over their lifetime. That's the most valuable by far. While a data breach like that which took place on October 9th resulting in exposure of sensitive data was unexpected and has a traumatic impact on the user and irrevocable consequences to the user's privacy, even normal use of the service doesn't guarantee confidentiality for your identity, phenotype, or genetic material. In fact, depending on what you've signed, there's active sharing of your personalized information or depersonalized information with third parties. We also know that depersonalized location data can be used to identify individuals and be repersonalized when combined with other data. Once the repersonalized data is combined with the genetic data, it would be possible to identify the individual the genetic data is connected with, even without name, social, and birth date. 
If you like the content and find it useful, please like and subscribe.